The Ludlow Massacre was one of the bloodiest labor events in American history, with the casualties totaling 25 along with over 40 more on the following days. In September of 1913, the United Mine Workers of America called a strike of coal miners to protest the low wages and the horrible working conditions the miners were exposed to every day. The strike reached a fever pitch on April 20, 1914, when the Colorado National Guard opened fire on the miners and their families in the tent colony of Ludlow. The Ludlow Massacre was a turning point for labor rights activists, changing the public's view of the current labor laws and the big corporations who manipulated them. The tragedy of the attack on the strikers rattled the entire nation, allowing significant changes to be made to mine workers' policies. However, this tragic beginning evolved into a triumph for the labor unions in striking mine workers, resulting in improved rights, wages, and working conditions. The coal miners of Colorado, and across America for that matter, were exposed to dangerous and deadly working conditions in the early 20th century. Miners were susceptible to being poisoned by gas leaks. They were being killed by rogue explosions and falling rocks. The workers were responsible for their own safety, even though they were endangering themselves for their company. When they suspected an unstable ceiling was overhead, they were the ones who had to add logs to hold it up. The miners would even sometimes carry mice who could easily detect vibrations and gases workers could not. They were not paid more for doing extra work. Another injustice committed against the mine workers was the fact that all of their property, including their homes, was owned by the company they spent their life slaving away for. Even their doctor's offices and the one store they had to shop at was company-owned. Workers were sometimes paid with scrip, a substitute for money only redeemable at the store. The miners had to fill their carts to the brim with coal and bring it to be weighed. Many miners and historians believe the scale was rigged, but they are helpless to do anything, for there are no check weightmen, as they were called, employed by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. The miners had to trust that the scale was correct against their better judgment. The Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, owned by John D. Rockefeller Jr., treated their workers with horrible working conditions and low wages. Many of the rights they were denied were written in Colorado law, but due to the government poorly enforcing them, the company was able to avoid following most of these laws, resulting in the mining industry having the highest mortality rates in Colorado than anywhere else in the U.S. Rockefeller was strongly against working unions, which the miners believed was part of their rights as an employee. They were tired of being denied their rights and needed to make their voices heard. On September 13, 1913, miners across Colorado voted to strike, to put down their tools and leave. The consequence of this action was immediate, as Colorado Fuel and Iron refused to house the miners or their families if they were no longer working. This resulted in the miners having to set up a tent colony, rented by the UMWA, away from Rockefeller's land. The 1,200 strikers and their families quickly set up and began preparing for the protesting and demonstrations. They were on strike for months and months, rallying for an 8-hour workday, a 10% increase in wages, recognition of workers' unions, their own separate homes and doctors, and the right to shop in stores that were not company-owned, just to name a few. However, the tensions were high from the start, as skirmishes and disputes were breaking out over the state between mine workers and the mine operators. The CFNI had more resources and money than the union, giving them more effective efforts to end the strike through fear and intimidation. A private security company called Baldwin Feltz was hired by the CFNI. Baldwin Feltz resorted to scare tactics to keep the strikers in check, using an armored car and a machine gun to shoot a nearby striking colony at Forbes. With one death and many terrorized citizens resulting from the attack, the striking miners gathered weapons and guns in defense. Colorado Governor Elias M. Ammons decided to employ the Colorado National Guard to keep the strained peace from escalating, a decision that would result in devastation. Tensions had been building between the National Guard and the strike breakers and the striking miners. However, they soon reached a breaking point, ending in a disaster that could only be called a massacre. On April 20th, 1914, the day after Orthodox Easter, the strikers at Ludlow began a normal day, bustling around the camp, cleaning, gathering, and teaching the children of the camp, until the National Guard opened fire upon the colony with machine guns, led by Lieutenant Carl Linderfeld. The striking colony of Ludlow quickly became a war zone, with the majority of the family members and strikers evacuating. The ones left behind were forced to find any shelter or to stay and fight. People ran towards foxholes and trenches. A group of 11 children and the three women who were taking care of them hid in a cellar under a tent. Although what exactly instigated the shooting at Ludlow is unknown, it is commonly believed that the National Guard came there looking for a prisoner or captive that was being held at the colony, but the miners refused to let them search and the militia attacked. 
Nevertheless, the guardsmen were ruthless in their attack. The ten-hour battle resulted in the rest of the inhabitants escaping, and the guards setting fire to the tents, burning it to the ground. All eleven of the children and two of the women in the cellar died after the tent above them caught fire and the pit collapsed. Those victims, along with 14 other strikers, including Union leader Louis Ticas and one militiaman, composed a death toll of 25. The death of Ticas was unique compared to others, as it is rumored the guards personally killed him after bashing his head with a rifle and shooting him three times in the back. The very next day, word of the tragedy rapidly spread around the U.S. The other strikers retaliated against the mine officials and destroyed the very mines they once worked for. Across Colorado, vengeful miners exploded mines and attacked the mine operators, only stopping on April 29th after overthrowing the minefields. The public feared a large-scale civil war breaking out after seeing the destruction caused by the miners. When words of these attacks reached the White House, President Woodrow Wilson sent the Federal National Guard to restore peace. Luckily, those soldiers were not partial to either side, effectively keeping the peace. The public response to the tragedy was a powerful force, driving the Rockefellers to release statement after statement in order to attempt to recover their tarnished reputation. Ironically, before the event, John Rockefeller Jr. was seen as a philanthropist, an opinion that quickly changed. The Rockefeller image was tarnished, and he would do anything to fix it. He was even so bold as to say there was no Ludlow Massacre. The engagement started as a desperate fight for life by two small squads of militia against the entire tent colony, which attacked them with over 300 armed men. He put a significant amount of money into public relations after the disaster, trying to restore his image. In the words of Union leader John Lawson, who said the millionaire invested in health for China, a refuge for birds, food for the Belgians, pensions for the New York widows, university training for the elect, and never a thought of a dollar for the thousands of men, women, and children who starved in Colorado. Rockefeller avoided donating and assisting laborers, a fact that did not help his public image. Although over 400 miners were arrested and tried in court for murder, only one was sentenced, proving that the public's favor was now on the side of the miners. The miners succeeded in bringing most of their goals to the public's and government's attention and forced Rockefeller to update his policies, even including a concession similar to a workers' union. To many, it may seem improbable that this tragic event could lead to triumphant outcomes. However, this is not the case. The Ludlow Massacre was instrumental in forcing the public to reevaluate their opinions about labor unions and the rights of laborers, to change their attitude towards big corporations, and to show how vulnerable monopolies could be. It also succeeded in giving more rights, like the recognition of workers' unions, to blue-collar workers who could feel more confident in their careers due to efforts of the striking coal miners. Although the tragedy is largely overshadowed by other important events during the time, its effects have never faded from today's society, influencing the workforce by reminding citizens of the importance of workplace rights. Many people may not be aware of the tragic event, but they are aware of the triumphant benefits it caused. The government enforcement of labor laws and the recognition of workers' unions across the country, a fact that cannot be underestimated. Due to the publicity of the massacre, laborers of today can feel free and protected in their careers. The Ludlow Massacre teaches the modern world that in order for a disaster like this to never happen again, we need to remember the triumphs that came from the tragedy.